Hi, it's Jeff Chalmers here from discoverdoublebass.com where you can go to learn about the double bass with our lessons, our courses, and we have interviews as well with some of the world's greatest players. And we're visiting New York and have some time for some interviews. So it was really a treat for me to invite my favorite bass players. And one of them is renowned for his hard swinging walking style, playing with gut strings, uh, producing his own projects and playing with some of the biggest names in the New York jazz scene. So it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Neil Miner. Neil, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Jeff. What a pleasure to be here. I'm just an honor for, for you to choose me to come to your show. Oh, well, you know, I, fan. I, I absolutely loved all of your music. I can remember about, I think it was back in 2013 or something, there was a talk based thread about one of your videos where you're playing, uh, it was the one I sent you actually, where you're ah, playing Sea Jam Blues. Okay. And it sounds like you're playing acoustically and there was just this attack and then, I went on a deep dive into your music, and uh, yeah, it's it's been a real joy. Um, why don't you, you set us up and maybe tell us with the kind of projects that you're doing right now in your New York? What does a typical week look like for you? Well, I'm I'm a freelancer, so uh, as you probably know, most bass players are. We we work with a lot of different people, which is really uh, it's a joy. It keeps it fresh and interesting. Um, uh, I work. A lot with singers. I've always somehow gravitated towards singers, which is wonderful if they're great singers, and I'm yeah. lucky that I get to work with some really great singers. But I also work with uh, instrumentalists as well. I work um, mostly since the pandemic. I've been in town sleeping in my own bed, which has just been wonderful not to have to travel. I haven't been on a plane in over two years. And uh, so I'd say uh, going downtown playing at Mesro. Yes. Um, playing at Smalls, I played there the other night, and I'm about to start next week at Birdland with Jane Monheit, who I've been playing with since 2007. Wow! So that and that's at Birdland. It's a really intimate kind of uh, concert. It's a wonderful a club. Yeah, we've had a, a long history there. Uh, I've been with her since like I said 2007, so we played there every year a couple times for a week, uh, and so yeah, just uh, you you name it, uh, all sorts of different stuff. I did a, a two-day recording session. Yesterday, that uh, just finished out in uh, New Jersey with Mike Molino, great drummer, with Grant Stewart, Joe Magnarelli, Jeb Patton. So that was a, a real challenge and a wonderful experience. It's just so cool to kind of hear about uh, what you're doing, and these names are some of the, you know, Jane Monahai, and the fact that you're playing in, in Birdland. That's a, yeah, a dream gig for many bass players. And I, I think I, I'm assuming that a big part of what they love about you is your sound, your tone, your you're so clear with what you're playing, your musical statements, and I don't know. I mean, that's how that's what I hear. But when when do you, do you, is that the case? Do you think these people are drawn to you for that? Why do you think that you get hired? That's a, that's a very good question. I mean, I just I try to do those things. I try to be clear uh, with my sound, and uh, I try to play in tune, which is is always a challenge. Yeah. as you know, there's no <laughs> no frets on this thing. Um, uh, just try to play. Uh, I try to give. I try to support. I'm, I, I, I think of myself more as a, a supporter than, uh, say, a soloist. Although I do enjoy soloing, uh, I just love to really make the band feel good and, and get a nice pocket going. All my favorites, uh, like Bob Cranshaw, they always talk about the pocket. And you know, instead of trying to maybe draw attention to myself, um, I'm more into drawing the attention to the others with, you know, giving them the support. So Bob Cranshaw, who else was uh, on your radar? Who was, when you started out, who was really kind of uh, set the flame for jazz for you, you know? Uh, well, the, the obvious uh, choices, Ray Brown, Paul yeah. Chambers, Doug Watkins, Red Mitchell. Um, gosh, there's so, so many. many. There's so Carter. many. There's so many. I mean, I, and then there's this guy, Tommy Williams, which a lot of people don't seem to know about. I don't know. But he... Um, is really one of my heroes, and he had a very short career. He w started out in the late 50s, early 60s, and he played, he was like an immediate talent, like a, a, just a supreme talent, kind of like a Scott LaFaro, wow. played many instruments, but the bass was the, the one that really took off for him. He immediately started playing with Benny Golson and the Jazz Tet, Art Farmer, and he, you know, you listen to the records that he's on, he's like the first soloist. He was obviously this really? brilliant talent, but he, uh, quit very quickly after uh, a short period of being on top, and then I think he he had kind of an early uh, passing, um, unfortunately. But he's really one of my heroes too, and I always try to turn my students on to him. Yeah, it's uh, some great names. Uh, how about Israel Crosby? Is he oh, somebody? Because yeah. I that, yeah. Sam Jones. I'm just thinking. Oh, Sam big... Jones. Yeah, I, I can't believe I didn't say him initially. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I love Sam Jones. Yeah, yeah uh, I think uh. you can hear that in your music. And to get to this point, <clears throat> what was the 
What did the journey look like? I, I read that you studied with Omin O'Brien, is that the case? It's I did. incredible I, uh, woman here in New York. I uh, was very lucky, yeah. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that experience. Um, well, I went to the Interlochen School, uh, Interlochen Arts Academy for high school. Yeah. And um, I went there kind of as an electric, I had, I had purchased an acoustic bass, but I was basically still an electric player and kind of scared to make the full plunge. Yeah. And when I went there, I had to be in the orchestra that was just the rule. So I was last chair and just kind of an embarrassment. Everyone's bow was in unison and I was kind of the guy that, you know. I've, been, I've been there before. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the trombone players are kind of snickering at me all the time. And, um, but I deserved it because it, it was, uh, you know, being thrown into the, the deep end. And um, so I found a great teacher. I guess I got recommended from yeah. some people and Orrin O'Brien's name came up. She's just retired uh, uh, actually, and she's one of the most famous teachers, you know, coming out of the lineage of Fred Zimmerman, who, came, who studied with Samandel. So yeah. it's this lineage of great hand position. And uh, yeah, I didn't really study the classics. She luckily allowed me to just use her technique for my left hand. I wasn't really, I'm not really much of an arco player. Mm -hmm. Um, I can play it uh, for ensemble parts, but I'm not, I don't solo with it. Not and a, Not uh, Paul Chambers kind of. No, 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 no. I yeah. mean, that's not my, I mean, I, I respect that, but um, I feel like any time I've ever tried to solo and then I put the bow down and try with my fingers, it, it just comes so much more naturally. I know mm -hmm. I would probably have to work towards it, but it doesn't really, it never felt, it never came naturally to me like some people. So yeah. I've always just said, you know, that's okay. Pettifer didn't solo with the bow. Yeah. Uh, some of my hero, you know, <laughs> other heroes, so. Uh, it's okay, but um, so yeah. But do you think that classical uh, experience helped you with your uh, your future journey? Would you recommend it to to other based jazz, aspiring jazz bass players? Absolutely, uh, and I and I also studied with Don Palma briefly, uh, who was uh, he's a great freelancing uh, classical bassist in New York um, with yeah. Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, and wow. just he's a, kind of a legend in New York and. There, it's just the the left hand and just the discipline, the pitch. They're 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 so precise about everything. So I I take that and I apply it to jazz. Yeah. Yeah. And um, like one of the things that I'm really interested in is your approach to walking bass. And who are some of the the names that you think of when you think of great sounding walking bass lines that have really inspired you over the years? Uh, well, those people I mentioned. Um, well, Ray Brown, I think, is kind of like the grandfather uh, or the godfather of, yeah. of walking because it's so clear his pitch, his time, his no choice, he out, the way he outlines chords, the way he connects chords. Yes. It's so beautiful. But then there's someone like Sam Jones who's the same, but almost maybe a little simpler almost, mm -hmm. but in a great way. Um, and you know, Israel Crosby is very complex and melodic. It's like he's playing mm -hmm. a counter melody. Um, so there's so many different approaches. I mean, when I when I walk a line, I just try to really just hear a line, but also know every chord that I'm uh, yeah. you know, representing. So that's kind of what I'm always thinking, and also listening to what they're doing. Never just going, okay, I know this tune, and I'm going to just play what I know. I'm always listening because someone might throw in something that is the way they play the tune, mm. you know, especially a pianist or a guitarist. So I'm always got the radars out. I think listening is very important. Did, has this kind of journey, uh, is, is, has it been based on a lot of listening to albums or has transcription been a part of it as well? Uh, did you ever write out bass lines or, uh, you know? How, I did, know? yeah. I went through a period where I, I transcribed the whole, uh, some couple Percy Heath tunes like uh, wow. uh, Bag's Groove, uh, yeah. like all the notes he played that he walked and then I walked along and just, feeling like you're actually in that rhythm section and hearing your notes, yeah, mm -hmm. that was, but I didn't do it a lot. I did it, Sam Jones, I did um, uh, Jimmy Blanton, uh, Ray Brown, I did a bunch, um, Paul Chambers, but then I guess once you do enough, you kind of like, all right, I, I kind of have a sense of what I shouldn't be doing and what I should mm -hmm. be doing. And then mm -hmm. every time I, I play a gig, I'm trying to kind of Learn something new, maybe, or mm. hear something new. Find a new way through the harmony and... Exactly, yeah. Try not to always repeat yourself. But then again, there's also nothing wrong with repeating yourself and being simple. Yeah. You know, not always trying to just be brilliant all the time. Not that I'm, I ever am, but I'm just, you know, just trying to really play something that's clear and just, 
lifts up the band, you know. And it's not just the notes, it's the feeling. You know? What about with your students? Because when they come to you and, and you're hearing them play, particularly with walking, in the context of walking bass, is there something, uh, are the common themes that, uh, with issues they may have that don't enable them to articulate quite as clearly as uh, a more experienced bass player? Um, I would say stay low and be simple. Like play a lot of roots and fifths and thirds and don't play a lot of color. I mean, you can. I mean, there's, there's different... T concepts as I'm sure you demonstrate in your videos, which uh, I love, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, you can walk quarterly, you can walk in a scalar type of way, you can walk in a chromatic sense where you're connecting notes, you can, uh, you can jump, uh, you know, do um, different interval intervallic walking. I mean, there's, I, th I think just blending them all, but um, I don't know, I try not to think too much about it because mm. then I feel like I'm thinking more about me than I'm thinking about the music. In the practice room, that's when I experiment, but then when I go to the gig, I really try to let go and just be in the moment with who I'm working with. And the other thing that I think all bass players are drawn to, naturally, is the sound of the instrument as well. Mm. And I, I mean, you're really renowned for having this huge acoustic sound that really projects, um, and you play with so much clarity whilst having, you know, uh, some, some gut strings on your bass mm. here. Um, I mean, how much has the the sound of gut strings affected your approach to walking bass? Do you feel that you play differently with gut strings than if you had like a set of uh, spiral vikes or something on? Uh, that's a good question. I, it's funny because starting out, uh, you know, I was listening to records Paul Chambers and hearing this beautiful sound from Prestige Records and going, yeah. well, why isn't my bass sounding like that? And of course I had steel strings like everybody else had in, in the uh, early 80s, low action and pickup. Um, I just, no one told me, and it took time, you know, meeting people who knew about it or older musicians or reading about it, but um, I think as soon as I got that sound in my, my ear, and, um, well, I, I first started out with all gut strings when, when I made the switch. I Why? put on the E, A, and D, and G, and the, the E and the A are usually wrapped with kind of a round wound. Yeah. Uh, it depends on the brand. Uh, and then the, the D and the G are plain, and they're... It's a beautiful sound, but there are all sorts of, there's just a multitude of problems that, that come with that. They unwind, they turn green from their sweat in the summer, the hairs unravel, it's just a mess. They go out of tune every five minutes if you go into air conditioning or if in this, in this winter when it, the heat comes on, they get brittle and the, it's, uh, it, but it's, that's all they had back then and, and they had to deal with it. it's like calf skin heads so yeah but uh, so what I tried to do and when I got this bass it didn't work with the E and the A um, I had a French bass before but uh, it need this bass needed more tension and the E and the A were just kind of flabby and the D I always had an issue with a, a gut D where it uh, would be way too floppy and, okay. and no it would be like kind of just thuddy and so I got the uh, olive which is a gut string wrapped in chrome, and it's it's a similar wrapping to a to a spiral core, which is or what what these are. And then the the G is a, a golden spiral, which is not made anymore. They made them up until I'd say the early 2000s, and then they went out of business because the Mad Cow um, epidemic really? affected, um, affected the company, and they they stopped making producing them. And a friend of mine tipped me off, and I bought about 20 of them. <laughs> The G's, because I already had my setup and I wanted to keep it, and so um, cool. they last about four or five years apiece. Wow. So I'm hopefully going to live, you know, long enough to have. The <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you yeah. will. And I, I mean, that the string looks almost new. So is that a golden spiral that's on there now? Then it is. Yeah, I it's a golden I, spiral, an olive, and then a, t a tomastic uh, spiral cord. So yeah, but I like the way they they kind of it blends. It's. Yeah. Uh, and it has more of a sustain than a yeah. than a than a, a plain gut can be a little thuddier or twangier. Yeah. And the D's got this nice kind of legato that yeah. it doesn't normally have with, with its plain gut. It's a little more thuddy, which can have a charm too. But I think that some basses just have better tension D's than others, and mm. mine didn't, unfortunately. So, so. It just, 
I feel like the bass, as soon as I got this set up, it kind of like, it came into its own. And it, um, I had a little work done. I, I was, I was mentioning to you, I got this bass in 95. Um, I had about, I bought it for $1,800. It's a Juzek, which wow. is just a basic kind of working bass that there were in a lot of the public schools back in the uh, 40s yeah. and 50s. And it needed some work. The neck was out of line, so they, yeah. re and they put a new fingerboard on, new bridge. The tuners, you could barely tune the bass, uh, oh, so we wow. got these uh, Sloan tuners, which were like really bright and shiny uh, for about 10 years, but now they're kind of dull and they look a little more normal. But yeah, so it's, uh, and it's a nice light bass. I love it for going up and down the subway stairs. I mean, I'm in and out of the subway all day or in this cab. So this is a good traveling bass. And uh, Are you a one bass guy? I have a Shen plywood, uh, which I just got a few years ago, so okay. I've always had just one bass. Yeah. Um, some, I know some bass players love to have many basses, and yeah. I, I could never understand which one are you going to take to the gig. I yeah. want to take this one. <laughs> I know? want to know what it's going to feel like. Exactly. And, and yeah. Yeah. Have that consistency. I mean, it's got such a great. It's a. Uh, it's got such a great sound, and, I, and of course, there's no uh, pickup on your on your bass, which is something that you notice straight away. I'm, um, I'm a little unusual in that sense. Uh, yeah. I I did try pickups out uh, when I was trying out the strings like everybody else and the only thing that I, I kind of liked was the trick where you take an underwood and you which go under the feet of the uh, the uh, little yeah. wings here is taking out this one so yeah. it's only in this one Peter Washington would do it we, we talked oh, wow. about that Dennis Irwin um, and it gives a little bit more of a poof than, than the wah kind of yeah. sound and so it's a bit quacky aren't they I always think it sounds a bit qu a like a quack, quack yeah, the, yeah, it does the underwood say, yeah, that yeah. Kind of sort of yeah yeah yeah, yeah, it's uh, so, uh, but I don't really. Uh, I love to try to like. I'll play it smalls acoustically. I'll play it really? mezzo acoustically, and uh, people sometimes will say, "Wow, you're playing a." I'll go, mm. "Yeah, but look at this thing. This is a giant speaker." People don't. They yeah. forget that when you hit a note, how how far that that sound wave actually travels, and if you if you really trust it and you you know maybe raise the strings a little bit. I don't have super high strings. I was going to say, you've got pretty moderate action. It's not crazy it's not, action, is no, it? No, I don't like it too high. I like no. it just just right where I can, where I get a little resistance, but I also am not struggling. And uh, so I love just trying to play acoustically most of the time, or I use a microphone. I have a, uh, a DPA 4099 that I mm. sus suspend um, with rubber bands uh, between the ah. feet of the bridge because it, they have a clip, but I find the clip can pull in like notes like that can pull in weird overtones. Really? But this is clean when it's in there, and it's like a little shock mount. So I use that. I have a, a Myers a multi-instrument pickup uh, that mic that goes in here, same thing. Mm -hmm. So I use that if I have to, but basically acoustically are mics. So if you're on a bigger show, um, mm -hmm. you know, you're playing a hall maybe, mm -hmm. will you just expect the engineer to get the live sound or maybe send them the DPA and... Uh, I just use you the know. DPA. I've yeah. only just used the DPA. All, wow. Big big shows I did uh, with Jane. We did a, a probably the biggest thing uh, outdoor uh, Brazil. It was like thousands of people, and wow. I just used the. And I also don't like use the uh, don't like to use monitors. Uh, oh, okay. I just like to hear the bass. I don't like to be blasted, and yeah. I'm I'm kind of unusual. And like people kind of look at me funny, but then after the show, like the the sound guys, they go, "No, it really worked. It sound you know." So I'm. I know it's uh, it's not a problem, and of course, if it was, I would change it because it's not all about me. Sure. But yeah, I want people to hear me. But uh, but I, I'm more comfortable like that. I always find that the the tipping point where I move to not playing acoustically is the introduction of a drummer, unless mm -hmm. they're being really sort of sensitive. But mm -hmm. um, so if, if you were playing in a piano trio situation, mm -hmm. no amp, you just you know. No, I mean I, I mean unless uh, I mean if it like this is a beautiful big instrument that's mm -hmm. acoustic. And if it's acoustic, I will be acoustic. But if he's heavily mic'd, I'll throw on a mic. Sure. Because I, you know, I don't want to be killing myself either or out of balance. It's all about being in balance. I like to be in balance. I try it. That's my main thing. Any tips on getting a big sound with the right hand? You, you seem to have a way of drawing a really huge, I mean, it loud, your bass, you know? Well, thank you. I mean, I don't, I, um, I never try to like get a huge sound. I'm not going for like Vulgar macho kind of, oh. kind of like, you know, yanking the string. I like to just bounce and, uh, I have this trick that um, where you put one finger on top of oh, another, yeah. Yeah. and you're basically Peter Washington walks that way. That's where I first learned it. Really? Paul Chambers did it. Uh, what you're doing basically is you're it's almost cheating. You're you're giving double the the weight than than just this. So mm. okay, yeah, and you don't have to. 
work any harder. And you're, you're, it's like big band guys did it. You know, it really gives a nice bounce and also yeah. gives every, like, a, an evenness instead of, like... I mean, it's like you, you know, you can play fast that way too. You just kind of have to lighten up and bounce. But it, that, that to me gets a really consistent. I mean, I also I might solo and, you know, alternate. Yeah. I might, you know, alternate in that sense, but I might also just... You know, so it's, you can do that too, but I, I don't think about it when I'm soloing. It just, things happen in that hand and I'm not planning it. I might practice a certain way, but then when I'm actually blowing, I'm just... Whatever happens, happens. You know? Yeah, it's just the, the notes just come out. That, yeah. It's like you want a phrase, you want a phrasing, your hand hopefully will accommodate. And there's a lot, of, a lot when you were soloing, it felt like there was a, a lot more happening in the left hand in terms of, you know, um, uh, articulating the triplets with pull-offs and, and what have you and, and that kind of thing to add more. I mean, if you're, if you're playing walking lines, I was, I'm always interested to people that use one fingers, mm -hmm. uh, one finger, sorry. Um, like, could you maybe speak a little bit about adding the, the, these triplet fills in when you're using... With, with this hand or with yeah, this hand? Yeah, with okay, the right okay. hand. I'm, well, uh, both. I mean, okay. Um, the whole... Well, the, another thing that's weird, uh, maybe about my bass, but I think a lot of basses have this problem, is there are weird boom notes and uh, wolf tones and overtones. Like, on my bass, when I hit um, a B on the G string and yeah. I'm not muting the E string... <laughs> hear that? <laughs> Yeah, there's a. Under it's the, it's it's sympathetically vibrating the E, and and that happens with other strings, you know. Yeah. You know, so same, yeah. so I've just gotten used to always keeping my my hand kind of muting, and that's why I have this down here too because ah, uh, this is just was. a little uh, muting element, like a it's a Velcro strap, but uh, a lot of basses, if you grab like sometimes a student will come over and I'll I'll grab down here while they're walking. And you, it can really tighten the sound up in a nice way. It can focus. Can you feel it. The energy when you're if somebody's walking and you and you grab the after length? Does it feel? Yeah, like, you, there's, it, there's vibrations. Yeah, you can actually. Sure. Yeah, on the other side of the bridge. I, I, I've never considered it before. Some people will say I'm wrong and that that's not good. That that's yeah. part of the sound. But I think it get it tightens the sound up at least for my bass. Uh, so I've yeah. I've done that. And I also like some like like Bob Cranshaw had that. You know, yeah. You know, which is really powerful. It was just amazing how powerful he could, but he could play really fast that way. I can't do it. But but he would not be muting any of these strings. So I that never feels right to me. So like Can I hear the difference? Yeah. When I'm muting it versus not muting. Yeah. So um, I just I'm always into trying not to get a weird boom notes and um, so that you know, that's how that started. Um, I just uh, always watched people's right hands. Like Peter Washington was an early influence for me. Yeah. John Weber was one of my teachers. Um, and th those guys have great right hands, left hands. But, you know, Ray Brown, you know, yeah. much more of a point, you know. And less kind of um, ghost notes, more articulating the quavers. Like, to my ear, you know, um, right. when Ray's playing those those fills, you hear the pitches rather than not like the preceding, you know, kind of ghost notey approach. That you mean like? Simply, yeah, I, I don't hear. Yeah, I don't hear that in Ray's playing as much. I no, hear you're more, right. Yeah, I hear more kind of the actual specific pitches, and then you know, the, uh, the, just the note. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think people did that as much back then because I think that you know, with gut strings, it's harder to kind of 
you're, you're, it's more about bouncing than yeah. a lower action where you can get much more kind of, you know, little yeah. tiny, you know. But um, I don't know. I, I just I've always been fascinated by by uh, that sound. I just had that sound in my ear, and I just tried to get it. And uh, mm. and as far as my right, my left hand, um, I, you know, coming up, I I'm maybe a year older than Christian McBride. I remember mm. when Christian McBride came to New York, and you know, just yeah. wow, you know, <laughs> yeah. just like seeing uh, talent of that level, and just you know, incredible speed with the right hand. Yes. Uh, and this other guy, Omer Avital, who came to New York probably in the mid '90s, another one just like blew my mind. Like, Absolutely. wow! And and he played with gut strings. Uh, so of course I was like home, yeah, you know, trying to do, and it never came naturally. Just like with the bow, it just some people I feel like have real natural dexterity. I never did, so I tried to compensate by, um, you know, Red Mitchell is one of my heroes, and he wow. has this, you know, things where he's. You know, he does these things. It's more yeah. horn-like, so I just figured, like, if I can get more kind of uh, expressive qualities using this hand as opposed to just speed, because if you think about it, like, put a bass solo on a tenor or a trumpet, it might sound silly. Dicka, 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 dicka. You know, like yeah. they're not phrasing. You know, they're 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 slurring. They're they're trills, there's pull off, you know, so I, I, that's what I kind of emulate when I solo. I try to think about saxophones, Coleman Hawkins, and uh, yeah. You know, just try, just try to like, yeah. you know, not, and Ray Brown did that too. He wouldn't just go, dicka, 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 he would, you know. Yeah. You know, so it's, I like to, to use both, you know, that's kind of my, always been my philosophy, but so it's a work in progress. You mentioned Red Mitchell, have you ever tried the fifths thing? Is that something oh, that you God. ever thought, uh, for me, it's all... That's, well, I admire his, anything he ever recorded and played, and I used to hear him, uh, I, I uh, was lucky, my father was a jazz fan, so I grew up around going to hear these greats uh, when I was, you know, 10, 12 years old, um, hearing Red Mitchell and... Hank Jones, going to Bradley's, and you know, Dizzy Gillespie, and Zoot Sims, and, and so um, George Mraz and Tommy Flanagan, I heard all the time wow. back then in the, in the 80s. And so, uh, just, uh, yeah, I mean, it just really blew my mind, you know. Just Have you got the uh, Red Mitchell, the Comets album? Yeah, I think it's, oh, in, yes. is it Embraceable You, maybe? Or yes. The duo one? And, uh, yes, yeah. Did you ever play with Lee Connors? Have you ever had that? No, no. I, I've met him many times, oh, wow. uh, but I, you know, would, would yeah. be an honor. But uh, no. And uh, but it, oh, and what you asked about Red Mitchell? Um, yeah. Yeah. The fifth thing. It's like another instrument. So you can't. It's almost like you can't even transcribe his yeah. stuff on fourths. But I can still take concepts and ideas, harmonic ideas, and I do. And I. But I love his stuff where he plays in fourths. Mm. And he was just such a brilliant musician, and just had this lyrical side that. You so rarely hear anymore um, on the bass. People are usually trying to play a lot of things, and, and he would pro t tend to play less things. And he could play, yeah. a, a, he had just brilliant chops, but he only used it when he needed them. You know, it wasn't just like, all right, here's my chops. Co uh, Here we course. go, yeah. Right. Well, what about with, with good strings? One of the challenges, of course, is uh, intonation. And, and how, have you, how have you found the experience of playing? With good, so you kind of tuning up every 10, 10 seconds, or is it, you it, know? I do. It's hard. I mean, I, I, especially when you're dealing with seasonal changes, um, yeah. and you know, or maybe going to an air conditioned room or a hot room. I do love the uh, digital tuners. It's yeah. changed my life. I know how to tune well, but I just love putting it on and just doing it like, like, yeah. in, in the middle of a, a tune. Someone's, you know, you yeah. Know, I can just quickly because sometimes it really goes way out of tune, and it's like really. Just not fair. <laughs> I think that's a great, a great bit of advice because I, I, I found when I've had um, experimented with an olive D and G, one of the things that got me is I found it slightly distracting that I would start to doubt myself about the tuning, mm -hmm. and I'd start to think, hang on, is this actually in tune? And uh, mm -hmm. perhaps that approach would have been a, a good way that I could have let that go and then, uh, you know, focus more on the, on actually playing. So. Oh, I, I know it was a real distraction back before the uh, the. The electric tuners and like having to ask the piano all the time. Can I, yeah. get, can I get a G? Can I get a D? You know, yeah. I mean, they would do it. And but now it's funny. This guy I play with, been playing with for years, Michael Kanan, who plays with Jane Monheit. Um, 
you know, it's taken him a while. Like anytime I'm like, he's like, mm, and I'm like, Mike, Mike, no, I, I got the tuner. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I love it in the recording studio. I'm t testing it all the time. It's just so brilliant. Um, any, any maintenance kind of things? You have to put oil on them or anything? Or, well, these or the, are the wrapped. The, uh, the, these are, um, I, I like the wrapped ones. With the yeah. uh, plain ones, you do have to put on mineral oil and you have to snip the hairs with like a nail clipper and uh, and then the uh, the E and the A, they unravel. I mean, they're like I said, they're a mess, but the sound is so beautiful and mm -hmm. unique. Um, it's, I think every bass player should try a real gut string set for at least a year. And maybe they'll, the takeaway would be, hey, I like a, a G string that's got a, a gut sound or I like the whole thing, you know, so it's, it's just nice to experiment, I think. I think it makes you, from my, I found that it made me play slightly differently, uh, you know, and I liked that, you know, experience. So one of your big projects that um, we wanted to, or I wanted to, to discuss is uh, Gut String Records. So, mm. like, could you speak to us a little bit about how that came about? Because it feels a, a natural segue from where we are at the moment. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I guess um, when... When Small's uh, Jazz Club had a, a label, this was before Spike owned it, it was just called Small's Records. And it was uh, started by Luke Haven, who was a, a regular and uh, lover of the music. And he recorded a bunch of people. Uh, I got luckily got to be recorded. And I just, I, I love composing and arranging, and I just found it really an uphill battle to get more than just one recording uh, deal or whatever. Um, so I figured I'm going to just start doing my own recordings uh, on my own. I'm going to like get gear. This is kind of before the whole internet, YouTube time. And uh, I just wanted to do real minimalist, old school recording where just a mic on the bass, mic on the piano, mic on the drums, mic on the saxophone or whatever, and just do it very simple and just um, put them out uh, on my own and start my own little label and I did and I found that I could also bring other people in and help them too but uh, the way Gut String Records works is it's not like I pay for everything and I own everything it's a co-op well okay so I um, I facilitate um, and the website that was designed it just uh, displays the artists and their projects in a, in a nice clear way and uh, just allows people to release records whenever they want to, and Gutstring Records kind of acts as a, uh, an umbrella and a hub, uh, a, a community, a support system. Uh, instead of everybody having their own little individual label, you know, reviewers then start to see the name Gutstring Records and they associate it maybe with a certain style. Yeah. And so it's grown, and I can't remember how many now, but maybe 30, 40 different artists, maybe more, I, can't, I have to look. Who are some of the bass players you've enjoyed recording? Um, Putting well, you on the spot there. Well, I did. I haven't done all of the recording. Uh, some people can just bring me their projects. I see. Uh, but I offer it. I, and I off, also offer video. I got four cameras. Very, everything's very low tech. So I'm just about doing it versus not doing it. Yeah. You know. But um, I know it could always be done in a much higher production level, as I'm seeing here today. Well, it looks uh, <laughs> great. I've always enjoyed the stuff that you put out. I think you've got a really like, clear way of doing it, and it, you, can really, you can really hear it. So, Thank you. Well, yeah. that's, as long as you can hear it and maybe see it, yeah. I think that's better than not seeing it or hearing it. So yeah. that's my philosophy. And the players that you thought that were particularly, the bass players that you've enjoyed like listening or that you've uh, published, is there any, any records that as a bass player we might be drawn to on your label? Uh, well, my dear old friend Ari Rowland uh, is on some uh, recordings and he's one of my fr earliest influences. Uh, we met when we were, I mean, I'm a couple years older than him. I think he was 13 and I was 15. And he really got me into jazz uh, and, and the acoustic bass and got strings. So. Yeah, and of course he's a mean with the bow, oh, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's a great he's, he's couple a of yeah. videos with him uh, doing some lessons. I want to say it's something like Jazz at the Lincoln it Center is. or something. You're right. Yeah. And uh, he sounds fantastic and he's got a few videos on there. So people should definitely check that out if they're interested in uh, Jazz with a Bow on gut strings as well. Very unique player. Very, very uh, just one of a kind and uh, very serious musician uh, in every respect. Yeah. 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 Very cool deal. Yeah. Well, just before we finish off, there's um, another thing that I'd like to just kind of touch on, which is the Dennis Irwin uh, video that you produced. Mm. 
And uh, maybe you could just speak a little bit about that experience and explain uh, for people who don't know who, uh, well, about who Dennis was and, and uh, you know, the, mm. how that video came about. Because I just think it's such a great resource for people to check out and they may not be aware of it. Oh, thank you. Um, well, Dennis uh, was one of the first bass players I heard playing with the Mel Lewis Orchestra at the Village Vanguard. Uh, like I said, my father used to take me to hear music all the time, so I went and I was immediately kind of just drawn uh, to Dennis because he played the bass. At that time, the early 80s, the bass was very loud with an amp and steel string sound and uh, very nasally, not the, not the way it's become now. It, mm. uh, it was kind of more crude. But Dennis was like, I'd never seen or felt a, a bass sound that way. And he was old school and really extreme high gut strings and really digging. And he was just a naturally big, strong guy, like a, like a football player. He just mm. had big hands and just power. And um, so I was immediately blown away, as pretty much everyone in New York has been. And he played with everybody. Um, Played with Johnny Griffin for years. Oh wow! Uh, I just heard him with so many different people over the years, and he could play in so many different styles. He could play a swing style, but like, like he sounded like Slam Stewart or something, or you know, just real authentic. He played with Latin musicians, um, uh, Brazilian mus musicians. I played with um, very modern musicians like Schofield, and he was everybody's favorite. I mean, he just had this way of magically making the band go to another level. So I, um, but sadly he died way too young. I, I don't think he was, I think he was like 58 or something like that, um, not even 60. Um, so he left this mark on New York that uh, has not been kind of touched since. I mean, he just has that, he just had this way. A lot of us have tried, uh, so many bass players have been influenced by him. So uh, his uh, partner at that time, uh, Aria Hendricks, John Hendricks' daughter, um, she had his bass. And I had to do a gig at, uh, with Annie Ross at the Metropolitan Room, and my bass had to be shipped to a gig. Um, I don't even remember who, who that was with me. It was with Jane Monheit. And I needed a bass, and I didn't have a s spare bass, so I said, could, could I use Dennis's bass for the gig? And so I deci decided to make it into a little mini documentary great of, story, the, of the 24 hours of going to get the bass, looking at it, talking about it, and um, going home, trying to practice on it, and being very uh, scared and terrified, and uh, then doing the gig and uh, got through it, you know. I, I love it, Neil, because it's for I, I wasn't aware of Dennis's work before the video. I don't mm. think at the mm. time, and you set the ball rolling. So then I'm googling and finding out and mm. checking out on YouTube, and I think it's just a brilliant way to tell a story. And uh, it's so fascinating that it's around his base, and it's a really joyful project. Um, so what's what's next for you in the you know in the in the pipeline? Have you got any more projects coming up like that, or any more albums or recordings? What's what's the future looking for you at the um, moment, Neil? Well, thank you. I'm I'm just trying to uh, play as much as I can. I love playing a lot. I love, yeah. it's like, uh, it's like going to the gym and also playing music. I mean, it's, uh, I, I do like to practice, but I'm not a practice fanatic the way some people are. I like to warm up and maybe get some ideas going, but I much prefer playing with people. So I just want to play, keep playing with great players in New York, which is, it's such a pleasure. There's so many wonderful players and I, I keep getting to work with even younger players in their 20s and I'm 52 now so it's just kind of like wow I'm, I'm, I'm not the young guy anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you look young, you've got a youthful way about you CD. I, I think I suspect your Thank colleagues you. all, all think of you still as being the young guy. The young well guy, you yeah. know it's I think it's in your head but uh, yeah. thank you for saying that but it's uh, and as far as recording goes um, it's funny like after starting the label it's like the less interested I am in my own projects and more just kind of wanting to help others and uh, but I will occasionally put out a project I like to compose but it just like once a, a year I might compose something or but I love working with uh, Sasha Dobson who's this wonderful vocalist that I work with uh, where she allows me to be kind of like the MD almost like the piano position because there is no chords and so Peter Bernstein sometimes plays with us though and uh, I do arranging for her, and she's starting to get a little more of a buzz for what she's doing. But uh, I just I love backing great musicians, uh, no matter who they are, and just getting in there and having fun. 
Well, your last record, Sweet Tooth, was just incredible, and I'd recommend it for people at home if they want to hear a, an example of your work. How about giving us one more CD that you're particularly proud of, maybe something with John, Jane Monahy, or uh, I'm not sure, is there a particular recording that you'd say, mm. yeah, I feel good about this? Gosh, it's, it's, it's so hard to s um, Yeah, I mean, I'm on four Jane Monahy records. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of all of them. Um, which, is your, which is one that stands out? What's, what's the first one with Jane? That must have been a special experience. Um, Gosh, I, I can't remember because I think one of the first ones I was just on like a couple of cuts, but uh, this one called Home, where, where she produced it uh, and we all were able to kind of really, instead of just having a producer come in and kind of run the show, which is great because that can be a brilliant uh, experience. Yeah. But uh, she let us all be kind of ourselves on that recording and uh, Michael and I did all the arranging and so that was a really special one, Home. Cool. Okay. Uh, and... Um, Gosh, uh, that's, well, Ian Hendrickson Smith uh, has put out a couple records that I'm on uh, live at Smalls, done some uh, live stuff at Mesro, Michael Kanan uh, Trio, who it's, I'm very proud to be a part of, he, we did live at Mesro with Greg Ruggiero, and I'm very proud of that stuff. But honestly, I'll tell you what, I feel like I'm being recorded every night at Mesro or at Smalls or no matter where you're playing. There's just so much, to, that's why I'm almost like I don't want to record anymore, uh, I don't need to, because it's just, that's, to me, that's the ultimate way to record, because sometimes you go in the studio, you get so serious and so kind of in your own head, but just to have your gigs recorded, that's the real way you sound, I think, so, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a really cool thing, and I suspect that as you, uh, uh, you know, reflect in years to come, you'll suddenly uh, learn more about other recordings that you've played on that'll be coming out, and you'll suddenly get a, a check in the mail for that live album that you weren't even aware that you were recording that at the time. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, Neil, it's been an absolute joy to meet you. I'm, I think we're going to wrap things up there. Where can people find out more about you? I mean, obviously, Gut String Records, your website? Uh, Neilminer.com, yeah. N-E-A-L-M-I-N-E-R. Um, cool. Neilminer.com. Uh, I don't really update it with my gigs, uh, so I, if you want to go to my Facebook page, people post the gigs that I'm on, and yeah. that's always a good way. But, um, yeah, I'm just... Uh, Hopefully going to be uh, around New York. Uh, come, che come check out a gig sometime. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thanks yeah. so much for joining me. And if uh, we're lucky, we might be able to convince Neil to play a tune. So thanks for watching at home. If you've enjoyed what you like, please click that like button. Uh, leave a comment and uh, let us know about uh, your experience with gut strings as well. And let's cut to um, a short performance by Neil.
right, cool. All right. Yeah, let's just, I'm, I'm, I like to do one takes. Yeah. Any, anything more will be, will be worse. Oh,